Thanks. Okay. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for sitting down with us again. We appreciate it. Could you recount again for me the incident uh, in which you were wounded? Well, I was standing on the top of this uh, hill at the aid station, and a random shell came in. It couldn't have gone off more than five or ten feet away from me because all I remember is a tremendous blast and a flash. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground in the snow, and I tried to get up. And when I tried to get up, I only thing I could see were the broken ends of my legs. And I thought my legs were gone. I was, because that's all, the, my, the broken part, both femurs were shattered. And they were laying down here as I was in my back trying to raise my legs up. And I thought, I'm dead. You know, I'm, I'm about to die. And I said, uh, I said my act of contrition, because I'm a Catholic. And then the next thing I thought of was my mother. And uh, I thought, what, what she, what she going to say? Because I was an only child. My name is C. Carwood Lipton. I was born in Huntington, West Virginia. Grew up in Huntington. Frederick T. Heiliger, Concord, Massachusetts was my hometown. I was born in a town named Inchelium, Washington. Uh, it's on an Indian reservation of northeastern Washington. My name's J.B. Stokes. I was born close to Bonham, Texas, in a rural area called Leonard. Born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. My father was a, worked for this railroad. My mother was a housewife. My nickname was Babe. And my mother, she was a little Irish brother, red hair, fiery. Great woman, great woman. Born and raised in South Philadelphia, where the times were tough. Mom had 10 children, so you had to work to survive. That's what it was. It's just survival in the streets of Philadelphia, that's all. It was a real struggle because we came up in the Depression. Sometimes we'd live on a farm and have uh, pigs and chickens and raise a garden. I saw people that really, really ha were hungry and had hard times. My father was able to find some kind of employment. Oh, and ne we never went hungry. We lived on a farm at the time. It was, was poor. Everybody was poor. That was the Depression. When I got to about 10, I got a paper route. You know, that <laughs> five bucks a month I made, something like that, you know. But it was at least something. There's a work ethic that the uh, Pennsylvania Dutch in this particular area are very proud of. I was the oldest one, so uh, I sort of branched out on my own at an early age. I was married when I was uh, 19 years old in 1941. On December 7th of 41, we were in a store and a guy, he says, the USA is in a war with Japan, and everything just went silent. 
I said, let's go in the Army. He said, hell, I don't want to go in no Army. I said, well, uh, you're going to have to go sooner or later. Something was wrong with you if you weren't in the service in those days. It was just what you had to do. I wasn't going to be in the infantry. I knew that. I was going to be in some top kind of a unit, or I wasn't going to be in the Army. Life magazine had run an article on paratroopers uh, sometime in early 1942. And it told about the training that they got and the uh, difficult physical requirements. And I just got interested in, uh, in seeing if I couldn't become a paratrooper. Nobody forced you to do this. You volunteered. And it was the notion that you wanted to do something. You wanted to be with the best. But once you got in there, you was proud to be. We was proud of our boots. We was proud of our shoulder pads. And uh, we was proud to be paratroopers. And uh, we was proud to be working with the guys we were working with. You know these people that you're in service with, you know those people better than you will ever know anybody in your life. I mean, you know them right down to the final thing, you know. And that, that comes when you start your training, while that, that progresses. Each man was like a heavyweight champ of the world boxer. Out of 100%, only 10% made it. I thought it. I was going to die. There wasn't no uh, holding back. You had to hang in there. You had to be tough. We marched 118 miles in three days. The training I got and the men I trained with gave me the confidence to, uh, to go into battle. We were just a bunch of ordinary kids when we went in, most of us. And a lot of the training was to build you up physically and mentally. Some of them lost as much as 40 pounds, but I didn't have none to lose. I weighed about 130. If I'd have lost 40 pounds, I wouldn't have been big enough to stay. You know, they weeded out uh, so many. We, they'd be there one day and they'd be gone the next. They couldn't keep up with them. You understand, they were good men, but they couldn't take that hard training. Well, he had the cream of the cream, the cream. Had to climb this mountain called Curhi every every morning, run it up and, and back. If you couldn't do it, why well, you'd end up in another unit. Of course, the name Curhi, as I understand it, means we stand alone together. That's a, an Indian name. It it became a symbol of of the camp because it was really rough and tough going up and down. A lot of times, on, especially on a Monday, when some of the guys would get out somewhere and get them a little drink or so, uh, you'd see them laying beside the road, you know, going up and coming back, you know, where they're sick. And it didn't matter how hard they trained you and how tired you got, you would still go out on your own and run the mountain at night, which was ridiculous because when you had to run it during the day, all you did was bitch and moan. And at night, you'd get a couple of guys and go up and do it on your own. We learned how to be soldiers at Tacoa as a group, all of us coming in from no experience in the Army at all, uh, coming in directly from civilian life. I'm going to say this. I believe that uh, the paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division was as well trained as you could get a soldier to be at that time. We packed our own shoots for the first jump. Uh, nervous as hell getting on a plane. You're asking yourself, what the hell am I doing here? It came time to stand up and hook up, and we did. Coming down is great. It affects everybody different. Not like a bird oh, flying in the air. Rope a foot on the first one. They're dropping 16 feet a second. I can remember just like it was yesterday. That morning after breakfast, they marched us all out there to the, uh, the airfield. There was a bunch of guys out there that had already made their jump. And they I was all hollering, you're going to be sorry, you know. You didn't want to be afraid, you know, because all these other guys are right there with you and, so, you know, your bravado and all that. But uh, you didn't want to be afraid, so you, you kept that out of your mind. You know, in those days, jumping out of an airplane is not like today. 
My first flight up, I jumped. Uh, I was years before I ever landed in an aircraft. And most of the, the, the fellow troopers was the same story. Well, foolishly, I didn't think it'd be so tough, but uh, uh, the first time, the first jump you make is not, uh, not all that bad. You don't know what you're doing. It just seemed like when you step out the door, why, the chute just opened right then. As I went out the door, I was blank. I cannot remember leaving the plane until after the chute opened up. I oh, got But after that, uh, it wasn't as bad. But it was kind of quite a thrill. It was just uh, like going on a roller coaster. <laughs> you get off and you want to go right back on again. Yeah. It was a thrill. It was a high, as they say these days. Everybody just seemed to enjoy themselves. They went out. The landing was the hardest part. Once I got out and the chute opened, I was happy to lock. You know, coming down is great. But I was small, too, and I didn't hurt myself when I hit the ground. Some of the big ones hit the ground like a ton of, what's the name? The thing you worried about most was your chute. Did you pack it right? And you'd go through that, you'd pack it one day and jump the next day. You had all night to think about it. <laughs> you know, all kinds of ideas of what you might have done wrong. Or, that worked out fine. So we made five jumps and the third week there. And uh, then you were a qualified paratrooper. Got your wings pinned on and uh, became one of the elite members of the parachute regiment. We were thoroughly prepared. Uh, the men were trained, hardened, physically and mentally, and they were ready to jump. Thus, we started off for Normandy. When you walk up that gangplank, you know you're gone. As you pull out of harbor and you pass the Statue of Liberty, will I ever be coming back? I don't know. You know you're in the parachute troops. You're going to be jumping behind the enemy lines. What do you expect? You have no idea. That'll make anybody stand and search his soul for a few minutes. We were ready. We were ready. We were stationed in England for about a year before D-Day. We had a lot of maneuvers and parachute jumping. They put us in a, in a camp preparing us for D-Day. In other words, uh, just about a week before D-Day, they put us in, and no liberties, no nothing. You couldn't get out of the camp. They had guards around the marshalling area, so nobody could leave. That's when you felt that this is it. We did not know which day. We did not know where we were going to jump until we were locked in. And then, they had the briefing to uh, tell you exactly where it, what your mission was. And they took a, uh, this map and they made a scale model of the features of the land. They put in all the little buildings, all the bridges, all the little knolls, all the sand dunes. Everything was in on that, on that uh, layout. We knew it by heart. We knew exactly where we'd go. You know. Knew exactly what to do. I mean, if you could, could have been there at the time to see where the planes were lined up and all the gliders hooked up to the planes. Tanks and trucks and fields and fields and fields of them. I had no idea that there was that much hardware. So there was no question about it. We knew it was going to be big. And that day that, uh, you know, we got the orders to get in the planes, this is it. We had confidence in our leaders and, and uh, 
all the, the plans and preparations that had taken place before the invasion. So I, we, were, we were confident and, uh, and calm. We carried everything that we thought we could carry in the line of uh, personal items, plus the necessary things we were assigned to carry, and, and we were loaded. Everybody got in there and a lot of them were very scared. I was scared too, but uh, probably in a different way that other people were. As long as I was in that plane and they were gonna get me there safely out of that plane, that's all that I worried about. At the time, I had no feeling whatsoever. Like I said, my feelings was for my brother who was killed at that time. That, that infuriated me to no end. And that's when, they, when I jumped on D-Day, I swore, I swore I was gonna kill every damn German I came across. And that's why I think they nicknamed me Wild Bill because I did a lot of killing D-Day. The sky was pretty clear coming across the channel. So since I was jump master, I could lie in the door, at the door of the plane with my head out and the slipstream looking down. And I saw the thousands of craft, ships, everything from LCIs to battleships down there in the channel. And I think that's when I first realized how large the invasion was, how tremendously large the invasion was. We rode for about an hour and a half, I guess, before we got, it we went down off the south end of England and then across the Jersey Islands and then across the Cherbourg Peninsula. And that's when the fireworks started. Black was terrible. And the aircraft was absolutely horrendous. It was like a July the 4th celebration, 10 times over. Then it would hit under the wings and body, and you could hear it going brrr, like gravel hitting on the fender of a car. You could see tracers all over the place. That's why everybody wanted to get out of the plane as fast as they could. Whether it was high, low, no matter where we were at, out. They wanted out of the plane. They were getting shot up. But finally, the, the pilots, I I'm just happened to read their minds as, OK, we got so much gas, and we're going to have to get back to England. So what are we going to do with all these guys back here? <laughs> Give them the green light sometime, get out, and we're standing there ready to jump. There was a certain relief, I think, when the green light came on and everybody said, let's go. Well, I jumped up on a run and hit the static line with the hook and out the door, you know, and, and uh, got such an opening blast from the, or opening shot from the prop blast that it broke this chin strap that we had on this helmet liner, and, and uh, that's when I lost this famous leg bag that everybody talks about just from the shock of the opening. Uh, it just flew right off my foot. The British come up with this. They call them leg bags. They gotta be this big, and you keep stuffing everything you can get your hands on in them. It's for the way 10, 15 pounds. By the time you get done, it's 40 or 50 or 60 pounds. Everyone that jumped with a leg bag or supplies, they lost it. Most of the paratroopers that landed didn't have nothing. I was one of them. It tore right off because we jumped at speeds of 150 miles an hour, maybe even higher, I don't know. And lower than we should have been. But uh, that wasn't bad either because you got to the ground quicker. <laughs> when it went out the door, opened up. 
I looked to see if my parachute was open, and you could see tracer bullets burning holes through the parachute. And they told us that all you'll have to do is shuffle up to the door, throw that leg out, prop blast will hit it, and you're gone. Well, they were right. Only I was gone out, and my leg was in. And I was hanging upside down, looking at everything down with my leg in the plane and everything. And all this happened in just a split second. And Paul rolled me out, Paul Rogers, roll, rolled me out. I just helped him out. I just picked him up and threw him out, I guess. Uh, I had to get out. We, we just wanted to get out so bad. And I come down uh, right behind City Hall, watched them shoot at me all the way, which wasn't very long. And I could see the tracers, and they were uh, kind of spraying around in the air. The, uh, whoever the machine gunner was down there that was uh, concentrating on me apparently was not a very good shot. But they were firing in every direction, even in front of you, back of you, you don't know which way to go. The next thing is that you are getting close to landing and you're saying, there's some trees, there's a road, try and slip to avoid the trees, try and slip to avoid landing on the road. And I slipped a little bit and my chute fell across the power lines and I hit that fence and fell into a, a farmer's garden. And that fence had, I'll never will forget it, it had glass in the top of it and cut me up and everything went there. That didn't bother me. I just, I was down, and I got down with my gun. I hit the ground in a kind of a field, and we were way, way up looking at my map, and we wasn't anywhere close to where we were supposed to be. We didn't know where we were. We was plumb off our maps that they'd give us. So uh, we had to make our way back. We knew that the beach was to the east of where we were, so we headed that way to get down to the beach to find out where the outfit was. My friend from Erie was in another plane. When I hit the ground, I hit about two feet away from him. And him and I start walking around looking for more of our troops. And we were running into Germans everywhere, but we had to hide, you know, because if, if we didn't, we were dead meat. And I let in a tree. I had my trench knife. And I reached up and grabbed a hold of this big, it's a big trunk, the tree. I swung into it. I, sweat, I cut those risers with, I think, one swipe. And I come down that tree like a monkey. And then there I was with a trench knife and a canteen and about six candy bars in my pocket, ready to fight the uh, German army, you know. So there's four guys that were with me on D-Day who did have nothing but a jump knife when they landed. So we had a hope scrounge. Uh, as it worked out for all of us, later on we r run across somebody who had been killed. And you take his weapon, and that's how you, you get a weapon for D-Day, rather haphazard. We were scattered all over the peninsula, practically. So it was uh, quite a confused situation, but we were uh, better prepared for it than the Germans were. The Germans didn't know where we were. Whereas on the beach, those people coming in on, that, on those boats, those Germans had those big guns aimed right at them, you know, and just waiting on them. Oh, they had it tough. They had it tough. I admire every one of them. These guns were pointed and firing right down on the beach. And the people out of the landing craft were trying to come onto the beach and they were firing right down on them. This battery of 105s was placed precisely where it should be to protect that causeway, any troops coming up the causeway. As you sit back years later on and look at it, you think, oh, this was laid out exactly right, uh, tactically.
We thought we knew where every foxhole was in Normandy. We knew where everything was. We knew it cold. But on this one, the Germans had moved in there and camouflaged us so well, we didn't know it was there. E Company was the assault company of the battalion. And we were been trained from special assaults and whatnot, special assignments. But they weren't aware of what we had. They didn't realize we only had 12 people. So we, we worked our way down through, a, through the farm area to a hedgerow, and Lieutenant Winters had us set up a firing position. And uh, went up to scout it for myself, crawled out along this hedgerow to get a little closer to look it over. And I felt I could see a trench and I thought I knew where our machine gun was. Winters was a, an exceptional leader, and he was able to size up all through the war, size up combat situations, and decide quickly and correctly the best way to take care of the, whatever the problem was. I divided the group into two units. Lieutenant Compton was with me. I gave him half the men, and I took half the men. Gave instructions, I went uh, Compton, Malarkey, and Winda crawl up there and hand grenade that machine gun, crawl through the grass. And as you throw your grenades, I'll charge up with the rest of the guys. So I had the two machine guns set up to give him covering fire while he crawled up there. I get out to this hedgerow and I peek, I look up and I peek through the bushes and I see a couple of Germans over here about oh, you know, 30, 50 yards away, stoking this gun and firing it. And so I pull out a hand grenade and I pull the pin on it and I threw it as high and as far as I could throw it in their general direction, the damn thing had enough hang time on it that about the time it got to them, it went off in the air and, and I got one of them. Then I jumped up with a couple other guys and we charged so that we all jumped into the first position together. They had trenches cut in there where they worked, the Germans did, and they jumped down in them trenches and they worked them Germans like a dose of salt. Three Germans broke off from this position to run across the field, which was the wrong thing to do from their viewpoint. We cut them down. I was in a trench and, and I looked and I saw an arm. I didn't even see the man was in a camouflage tent and I didn't even see him. And then I saw an arm stuck over that tent and one of those potato masher grenades, you know, with a stick come out of there and, and it, and I said, well, he's gonna miss me. And that thing fell right down in that trench with me. And I was trying to scuttle my way out of the way of it and it went off. And I felt like it blowed my butt over my head. And pretty near did. He's behind the enemy lines on D-Day. Does he holler help? No. He hollers, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I'm sorry. I goofed. I felt like I kind of let him down, but you know, that's neither here nor there. My God. It's beautiful when you think of a guy who is that dedicated to his company, to his buddies, that he apologizes for getting hit. But that's the kind of a guy he was, and that's the kind each one of them was. They were all the same. I look upon them, each man with great respect, respect I can't describe. Each one of them proved himself uh, that he could do the job.
We've been through Normandy. We've been through battle. And maybe if I had been harder, if I had done a little bit better job, there would have been a couple more men going home. I never thought I'd get through D-Day, let alone the next phase or the next phase. I thought I was going to get killed instantly. The chances of survival is very, very slim, extremely slim. As the parachute, we got that done in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, 1944, me and Johnny Martin, drunk as a skunk. Well, Garnier and I decided we'd go to Scotland and get a tattoo. Didn't, we didn't figure we had a chance to come home. It, uh, yeah, but we thought, we thought, well, hell, the war's just starting, and Christ, we're 50 percent not gone now, so it's long haul. The 101st came back from Normandy after about 33 days, and we were the replacements for the people who, who were killed in action or wounded in the Normandy uh, mission. There were young kids that came in, and for some reason, I don't know why, they were the first ones killed. And I think maybe they were trying to impress the older guys, maybe people like me or Shifty. We were in awe of them. They, they were wearing infantry badges, you know, their uniform. They had a star on their jump wings. They, uh, uh, they were like heroes to us, you know. That's how we looked at them. I don't know why, but uh, I got right there to where I didn't want to be friendly with replacements coming in because, God, I didn't like seeing them get killed. I just, it just tore me up. and. The, uh, the, uh, I don't know why, but they were the first ones killed. My 10-man squad that I was in, eight were replacements, and the, the squad leader and the assistant squad leader, Sergeant Muck and Corporal Pinkella, well, they'd been to Normandy. We had not. There were eight of us that hadn't been anywhere but Auburn, you see, so. And then we, the training got really tough. Between there and, and the Holland Jump, it was training, training, training. And we had a couple of missions scratched. We were supposed to jump on a, a French city of Tournai. And it got to the sand table part where we all gathered around to see which bridges we were going to do, who was going to do what. And General Patton's troops overran the drop zone. So that one was called off. And we were wondering if we were ever going to get to go. And then, of course, it got to be September. Sunday afternoon, noon time, 70 degrees. The drop was perfect. It was a mass drop. Everybody was dropping on the same field. Daytime drop's a lot easier. You can see where you're going. You can sort of prepare for the landing. I saw a plowed field, and I slipped right over it, and I believe I almost landed standing up, you know, soft, a great jump. The most dangerous part about it was the fact that people are losing, continually losing helmets and equipment, and all this equipment's raining down. And if you got hit with this, you're going to be killed or wounded before you get off the drop zone. Everybody got together. We all assembled very fast. We moved out towards uh, the Wilhelmina Canal. Our mission was first to uh, take a bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal. It took us hours to get there. And taking hours to get there, the few German troops that were to secure this bridge had plenty of time to set their charges to blow the thing up. And just as we got to it, I was maybe 150 yards away, it blew up in our faces. These rocks and timbers were flying and they're falling all around you, and you can't help but think to yourself, my God, what a way to die in combat, to be killed with a flying timber. Uh, 
that we were that close. It uh, delayed us until the next morning. We wanted to get across that night, but uh, it took us till the next morning to get across. But once we got in, the, the Dutch, they, it was just marvelous, their, their reaction. They, uh, they loved Americans and still do for uh, coming in there and pushing the Germans out. They call us angels from the sky, which we were. I mean, you, you were on the German occupation for four years, right? It's horrible when you see paratroopers come out of the sky on Sunday morning. Who are they? They're your angels. They love you. Their welcome was unbelievable. They couldn't restrain their, how happy they were to see you. And it was hard to even get down the streets because the people were out there swarming all over us trying to congratulate us for being there and all that. And they hugged you and kissed you, and we didn't mind. You know, naturally, we was young. <laughs> we didn't mind at all. And they were really proud to see us. And uh, to the point where it was dangerous for us trying to clean out the town because snipers did some damage in that situation like that. We had a lot of fighting in that area because we're sitting right on the Rhine River and Germany's right across the river, you know. They're fighting like heck to keep us out of Germany. It's called the island, we call it the island. And we set up uh, positions there. Had some substantial battles there. They could observe any movement we made during the daytime. And uh, at their will, they could uh, shell us, mortar, put mortar fire on us when they had an op target of opportunity. I heard something coming down. I knew what it was, a, a, a mortar shell. And I threw my arm up like that and went down. It lit within three feet of me or four. But it, it lets it, when it blows, it goes up like that. And it went through my arm and hit me in the head, and I was, I was bleeding pretty, pretty good. Well, I was picked to go up on a dike. So I, of course, when you get to the top, you don't expose yourself. So I took my rifle and put my helmet on it and put it over, even with the road on a dike. And no action, so I brought it back down, put the helmet on, and I sort of peeked over. When I peeked over, I see a hand there with a potato masher, and he threw it at me. I ducked down it, hit my helmet, and bounced off. So when that thing bounced off my helmet, I hollered out to the guys below, live grenade. If Lesnowski hadn't hollered live grenade, and I had enough sense to know that that's that grenade that hit my rifle and is laying right in front of me, in my face, practically, I know I'd have either had my head blown off or I would have definitely been blind. There's no question about that, not any question, because I just got turned just part way, and it exploded, and then it, it caught me in the face, neck, left arm, under the arm, in the shoulder blade. I hollered for them to you know, take off. I said, get the hell going back, and I had eight grenades, so I started taking them off, pulling the pins, and throwing them over. And while the grenades are, rolling down or landing wherever they were, they were hitting some of the crowds because I could hear screaming, hollering, crying, you know. And I think I threw the eight grenades in about four seconds. And then I took off running. So the doctor that counted the holes in me down at Nijmegen, yeah, Nijmegen, the first doctor that really counted the holes I, uh, said it was 32. That was our first experience with artillery in large numbers. And I can remember sitting there at night, a couple of nights, listening to the artillery land. Wham! And the 88 was the fiercest uh, cannon or uh, gun that the, the Germans had. And it was the way they used it. 
It was an all-purpose gun. It could shoot anti-aircraft tanks, anti-personnel, uh, airburst, and that was the bad ones when the, the shell went up over your head. I saw a huge mushroom cloud from the shell, and Joe Toy stepped out of it. And I run up. I remember that like it was just I run up and I grab him. And he said, oh, don't touch me. I said, Joe, what's my? He said, I'm hit all over. He said, I, I'm bad. I said, OK. I said, I'm going to go see Jim. He said, as bad as he was hurting Joe Toy, he said, Heffern, I already checked him. He's gone. Jim Campbell might be alive today. If he hadn't have said to me, Heffern, you stay here with your gun. I'm going up. And I never, 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 I sleep on it, I eat on it, I, I never, never forgot that. And anybody that went through it is going to tell you the same thing. They can't die. It's just so bad all your life. You got to remember what one guy did because he thought it was his job to do, and he took a shot for you. The exhaustion on these men, the physical exhaustion, affects their endurance to be able to cope. You don't realize that at the time you come off the line from living in the mud and being absolutely miserable for 70 days straight, uh, you didn't realize at that point that you're only going to be off the line for a few days and you're going to be facing Bastogne. This is the last desperate action of the Germans to uh, turn the tide of this whole war. Bastogne, oh, it is. This it is, is the Old Jack's Woods, right? Yeah. It is the woods. Sure looks different now. There ain't no snow. These trees might have been replanted. Look how I think if the trees look like they did in '44 and '45, we could get a better idea. That's it. Yeah. It's the town of Foy. Oh, this is definitely the area. This yeah. is definitely. Well, there's the town of Foy, right over there, after the empty field where those cattle are grazing. About half a mile away to be. Right? Yeah, we had an outpost set up, looking right into the town of Foy. And they had to watch everything going on. Because we'd come in here and go to sleep. We had our foxholes right over here. And the other area, and the other area, wherever we had to move out and dig in again, of course, the crowds had plenty of artillery. Most intense I ever yes. went through, buddy. Shelling. Right. Most intense in the world. You couldn't believe it. You had to be here. You just dove in the hole and just pray. That's it. If it yeah. comes in, you ain't going to know it. You ain't going to know we it. We lost Muck and Pantella over on this side. They were killed instantly. Shell Direct hit, 88. Direct hit right in the hole. 
just made mush, mince meat out of them. Georgie Lutz come over and he hollered, I can't see nothing of them. There, there's nothing there. They were all gone, just disintegrated. Unmerciful showing, really. Everything I think was shredded. Yeah. Yeah, shredded. Right. I tell you, it's an odd feeling. To me, it brings a lot of memories. Yeah. The memories of well, the men, the times, good and bad. A lot of memories. It was the most miserable place I've ever been in my life. Even today, a real cold night, we go to bed and I, my, my wife will tell you that the first thing I'll say is I'm glad I'm not in Bastogne. The Germans wanted to get Bastogne because of the road network. That's why it was such an objective. So that's where we had to hold, which we did. Three hundred and eighteen trucks come in around noontime, and by uh, that evening, everybody was loaded and moving out. We were short of equipment. We didn't have enough ammunition. We didn't have enough warm clothes. But we had confidence that our higher military authorities would get to us whatever we needed. That when we got up there, we didn't know what we were getting into. There was very little information, only that the Germans had broken through. We went down and loaded on the trucks, and another truck came by with weapons, and they pitch out, pitch weapons up to the truck, and you catch a weapon, that's what you got until you got the best home. As it worked out, there's some men actually got on the trucks and left for Bastogne and didn't have a rifle. When we got there, we saw men and singly and in twos and threes working their way back, some of them even without weapons, without equipment. They were, some of them were terrified. They were beat to a nub, and they, every one of them were telling us, you know, they're going to kill everybody. They're running over everybody. They couldn't believe when they saw us up there that we intended to set up defensive lines and to stop the Germans. They, they said they couldn't be stopped. We went out of town, we started taking up their weapons and their ammunition. Asking the guys that's retreating, you got any extra ammunition or a hand grenade you don't want? Get, oh yeah, you could hear the firing going on up ahead and we're marching towards it with hardly any ammunition. We marched through the night and uh, went up to the forward side of Bastogne and dug in and then it snowed. Snow, cold up to your rump. We didn't have no winter clothing or nothing. And that's where a third of the doggone casualty was either frostbite or trench foot, whatever you want to call it. Bad move. A lot of snow. A lot of everything you didn't like. Ooh, cold place. At this particular time, we was on top of a kind of a hill. And top of the hill had pine trees and we set up our positions around the fringe of the woods. In Belgium, the trees are planted. They don't grow like they do in Maine. They're rows of trees. You look down a row and you can see a half a mile. And there was on top of this hill, there was a ridge with a tree line. We were dug in on that ridge. Germans knew right where we were, and they really gave us a shellacking. To our infantrymen in, uh, in wartime, the Mother Earth is your best friend. And uh, you can always dig a hole and get out of sight, you know. We dug plenty of those. Yeah. You'd be surprised how quick you can get through that hard ground when somebody's shooting at you and them shells are falling. Now, you can make fast work of it. We just have to dig that hole. Well, we say we came experts on foreign European soil. We dug in, and two people could dig a better hole than one. In the ground that's frozen, it takes quite a while. You just chip it out. And by the time you get it done, they whistle for you to, we're moving out. 
and you go someplace else and dig another one. Now, you must understand, the Germans were, we were surrounded. The Germans were about maybe 100, 100 yards away from us. No matter where you looked around in the circle, you could see artillery flashes. So you knew from, we knew from that that we were surrounded. But we went through a couple of shellings uh, at Bastogne that were uh, earth-shaking. If you lived through them, you remember them for the rest of your life. And I'm not sure you're the same for the rest of your life after you've lived through them. You never forget them. There was one moment there that I remember vividly. That I'll never forget it. One of the guys got hit in the arm with a piece of shrapnel, took his arm off above the elbow. And they were going to take him out. He said, get my wristwatch off my arm. And 40 took him out. That always stayed with me. I mean, it, my calm voice and everything, get my wristwatch off my arm. On the 3rd of January, we withdrew back to our former positions there uh, up the hill from Foy. And when we got there, we could see that uh, the Germans had zeroed in artillery there. Because trees were knocked down, branches were knocked out of trees, there were holes in the ground. It was right at dusk, and the Germans had this, you know, this woods of ours zeroed in completely. And, and as we hit the woods, why this tremendous artillery attack came. They knew where we were, and uh, they started shooting uh, point-blank 88s into our area. They were letting us have it, everything, everything. They come in the kitchen sink, mortars, airflow whoppers. That's a rocket thing, it's a screaming sound. It scared the hell out. I mean, I was scared, but I think I was petrified then. I thought the whole world, I thought the whole world was shooting at us at once. I jumped into a foxhole that somebody had started, and then hadn't finished. So I was crouched down in that foxhole, but uh, it, it wouldn't hold all of me, so from about my nose up was, was above the ground. I could see all these shells hitting. Sergeant Garnier lost a leg and Joe Toy lost a leg in the same place right there on one, on one hill, I remember. Uh, just this certain instance, you know. Joe got caught not near his hole, and uh, Bill and I were ahead of him, and, and Bill had not been hit, and uh, he came up out of, the, out of his hole quickly, and we were still under heavy fire. Joe said, Jesus Christ, what, what do I have to do to die? He got hit real bad in the back and the leg, and he's out there and had a medic, and he couldn't, can't find a medic. I went out to see what I could do for him. Bongo, I got it too. I went over to Garnier. He was sitting on the ground. His leg was badly mangled. He was holding his leg, and it was jerking like that. And he said, Lip, they got old Garnier this time. He had been hit before, but uh, they really got him there. We got him out of there, like Babe Heffern and I and some others, and, and uh, they brought a, a jeep down, and we put them on stretchers, and, and uh, I better not talk about it. Yeah, better not talk about it. They're terrible. We had lost some uh, very good men there. Toy and Garnier had lost their legs there. Uh, a number of other people were killed. It was uh, a difficult situation there. When a man was wounded, we felt glad for them. We felt happy for them. He had a ticket to get out of there and maybe a ticket to go home. And when we had a man who was killed, we found that he was at peace, and he looked so peaceful. And we were glad that he found peace. 
we had this uh, assistant squad leader named Mallet. He was from New York City. And I overheard him talking one time. This was in Bastogne. He says, uh, I've been through uh, Normandy and I went through Harlem. And to this day, he says, I haven't got one scratch. He says, I'm afraid when I do get it, I'm really going to get it. And uh, he was right. In this little town of Foy, he, he got killed. So uh, I don't think he had any premonition of it. He just he just wondered about it, you know. But I never did wonder. Never give it much thought. You just, you just live from day uh, day to day. Keep your fingers crossed, and that was it. Present the Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower. It is a great personal honor for me to be here today to take part in a ceremony that is unique in American history. Never before has a full division been cited by the War Department in the name of the President for gallantry in action. This day marks the beginning of a new tradition in the American Army. With that tradition, therefore, will always be associated the name of the 101st Airborne Division and of Bastogne. Good luck and God be with each of you. The Germans had started to surrender. They still had their arms. But as you're going down the, uh, the Autobahn, uh, there was almost a solid line of German troops coming north. And uh, our job is to get to the end and get to the heart of it. Butcher's Garden, that's the end of the line. It's the re retreat that Hitler had for himself. And he built his uh, eagle's nest, his penthouse, on top of the Alp to, uh, I'm sure, relax and confer with his staff because they all followed him to Birch's Garden. This was their final retreat. And of course, this is where they had their, their loot as well. This was the goal of the French who were on our right flank. This was the goal of uh, the British. And this is a place to capture. This is the one everybody wanted. Hitler's Berchtesgaden retreat, burned by SS troops in the war's last days. The chalet from which he hoped to rule the world now lies in ruins. American Air Force's pictures show the huge gutted rooms and the great window through which the Fuhrer gazed out on the Alps. We took Birch's Garden May the 5th. And no fighting, no shooting. The only thing I seen at Birch's Garden was a couple dead black uniform SS troopers laying on the road as we were going up. It was a beautiful country. He knew how to pick out a good spot for a house. We took over his house and uh, liberated it, you might say. There was uh, obviously uh, a loot of all kinds that the men were looking for, uh, such as uh, guns. There was money that they were looting. I was a pack rat anyway. I picked up a lot of German items, including some uh, postcards and envelopes that were addressed to Hitler. Come find out. That place was full of this big arch, you know, Rembrandt and all those people, you know, and hanging on the wall, you know. Of course, the old soldiers like us, we don't recognize a painting when we see it. The 101st Airborne Division uncovers Hermann Goering's personal art collection, 
hidden in a subterranean chamber. 1,200 artworks worth untold millions are included. The treasures will go back to rightful owners in pillaged nations. We found a, a warehouse full of gin and uh, vodka and stuff like that. It wasn't much whiskey. Those people don't like whiskey. And we took it all and set up a bar. Had seven truckloads of champagne and cognac out of the wine cellars out of <laughs> the yeah. eagle's nest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we stayed pretty well oiled for a oh, while. Oh, <laughs> that champagne was good. Ooh, yeah. it was good. <laughs> I started drinking it one day, and I drank it till about midnight that night. I went to the barracks, went to sleep. I didn't wake up the next day. I made a two-day thing out of it, and it tasted. Didn't taste like it would hurt you. It tastes like ginger ale. That exactly was the was. only time that I can ever remember that when I was in service that the whole company fell out in their underwear. We didn't even have to dress, you know. because <laughs> uh, Everybody was pretty well looped, and uh, so uh, we just fell out in line formation in our underwear. They're enjoying themselves. They're at peace with the world. They have a big, happy, satisfied grin on their face. It was a paradise for a soldier to move into. I had no problem with looting because of the fact that I had come down through Germany and I had seen the Holocaust. And I had seen what the Germans had done to the Jewish race and I'd seen what they had done to uh, the displaced persons and what they had done in their occupation of France and, and what they had done to their occupation in Holland, Belgium, so that uh, by taking over their homes for a few nights to uh, bed down my men, and uh, if they picked up a few trinkets, I had no problem. Nobody has ever taken the time to tell you how to handle a surrender. Jeez, <laughs> we'll talk about that when we get there. Well, here we are, we got it. Now, how do you handle this? The German army was a well-disciplined army. And uh, those prisoners that come down out of the Alps, they came down in formation. They marched down. They didn't. They didn't drag down, you know, or nothing like that. Uh, they came down as uh, as as uh, defeated soldiers. I think we thought that the Germans were probably the evilest people in the world, but as the war went along, we found out also that it wasn't the Germans per se. It was the SS and the special troops. They were the ones that could kill their own people, and the regular German soldier would not that way. One of those prisoners handed me this little book I could have, and I looked at it, and it was a little Catholic uh, prayer book for the mass. And all of a sudden, I'm faced with the thing, hey, I haven't got Nazis here, I got some Catholics. And I've got a Catholic good enough to stick one of these in his pocket. A lot of those soldiers, I've thought about this often. That man and I might have been good friends. We might have, we might have had a lot in common. We might have liked to fish, you know, he might have liked to hunt. Uh, you never know, you know. Of course, they were doing what they were supposed to do, and I was trying to do what I was supposed to do. Uh, but uh, under different circumstances, we might have been good friends. I have a great deal of respect for them as soldiers. They were very good soldiers. But they're still enemy, so they must be controlled as prisoners. When it reached the level of surrender for company and smaller units, I was assigned this major. And when he walked in, he presented me this pistol and offered his personal surrender. which naturally I accepted gratefully. So that would be 
the end of the war for his men, and this is basically the end of the war for my men. And the significance is that it wasn't until later when he had given me this pistol and I had a chance to look at it carefully that I realized this pistol had never been fired. There was no blood on it. That's the way all wars should end, with an agreement with no blood on it. And I assure you, this pistol has never, never been fired since I've had it, and it will not be fired. We didn't come home and, and flout ourselves. I didn't come home and, you know, I was a war hero or anything. I just come home and went back to look like we did before we went. Just go to work and live our life. I think it was difficult for most fellows coming back. They didn't know what they were going to do when they got out. I didn't, had no idea. Went to work for a coal company. Did some bartending and ran a pool hall. And Took a course in ornamental horticulture. It didn't pay very much, but a lot of nice people. I went to work uh, where I was working before the war. It was Caterpillar Tractor Company. I became an industrial arts teacher and a social studies teacher. The spring of 46, I took a boat to uh, Ketchikan, Alaska. I went to work for the government, a letter carrier for 37 years. I built home. I went into construction. I went into hard work, tedious work. I'd done everything. You name it, I'd done it. I ended up working on the waterfront. And I went with the CIA in Washington. Got my degree in 1948. After the war, I became a teacher and taught for almost 30 years. Got a job working for Nixon Nitration Works. I was making $75 a week. We've never become wealthy in life, but we have a lot of other wealth that means more than that, really. Everyone done well. I done well, too. Thank God. I want to welcome each and every one of you to our banquet tonight to celebrate the ending of a fine reunion. Thank you all for coming. And I want to extend the best wishes to all the men from Company E506. I love you. God bless you all. Thank you. The purpose the reunions serve is just to give us a chance to get together and talk to each other. We relive some of the Army experiences, but we have great respect and you might say affection for each other. The type of affection that you get when you've lived through many dangerous situations together and have learned that you can rely on each other. If you see the people today, that bond still there, the bond you can't explain. As soon as you see them, you know you're thinking of battles and thinking of it to yourself. The men stand out amongst each other. There's an intimacy develops, and uh, like nothing that I've ever experienced anywhere, not in college, not, not in any, with any other group of people. We're a strange bunch of uh, dudes, as far as I'm concerned, to be this close after all these years. That's, that's the thing that gets me, is uh, I like brothers. I'm back in my youth now. When I get to these guys, I'm back when I went to service. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'd like to make 20 more reunions. We had a lot of real good times in there. And those are the times that you really remember, you know. That's, a lot of those is what we kid each other about, you know, at these reunions a lot of times. And uh, then you had a lot of bad times. My family didn't know anything about it. And I would just didn't tell them I just, you know, figured it's something that uh, didn't need talking about. It was done, over with. We didn't know Shifty the way the men mm. know Shifty. Yeah. So, but we, he started talking about it just in the last five or six years, last five, I'd say. It was like he, that was another life, you know, as 
he was another person, and uh, we weren't aware that uh, the stuff he went through, things he'd seen. I didn't even, you know, it didn't even dawn on me that he'd killed people. I, I really, I really admire my dad, my daddy. <laughs> He's a, he's a good guy. He's a real strong guy. We travel a lot, and we've been to, to France and to that cemetery. It's just incredible. There's crosses upon crosses upon crosses and just lined up perfectly as far as the eye can see. And then there's the cliff, you know, and then the ocean. These weren't just anonymous statistics. These were people that I knew. And these were, and I told my daughter, I said, this guy here, died at age 19 or 20. A whole life, never lived. No family, nothing. No children, no, no opportunity to have some satisfaction of building a life, nothing. When I went there, I said, Dad, my gosh, Dad, you were so lucky. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, I'm very lucky, and he started crying. <laughs> These guys have been with each other in the absolute base experiences of human existence. They were there with each other, knowing you're gonna die, or thinking you're gonna die, or seeing people dying all around you. And there they went, day after day, and uh, I admire that. It held my father even on his tombstone as Sergeant Joe Toy. <laughs> 506 PIR, 101st Airborne Division. That's what he wanted on his tombstone. It meant that much to him. How it happened that uh, those various individuals happened to end up in E Company, I don't know. But as you know, every Army unit thinks it's the best. Uh, but we knew we were the best. Think about your guys more than anything else. Think about most of them every day. Something is etched in your memory, I guess. You'll never leave either. Am I a little proud of having once served in that outfit? You bet your life. I wore that eagle on my right shoulder for 18 years probably the proudest thing in my whole life, having been in Easy Company 506. The heroes had crosses over their heads, the ones that are buried in the cemeteries. Those are the true heroes, not us. We're just part of the work, that's all. And we thank God we got back alive, that's all. How would you like to be a mother or a father and son never come back? The son and the mother and father of the heroes of the Second World War. How did the guys come home? Let me say this. I don't believe there's very, very, very few heroes that came back from the war. They're still over there. Do you remember the letter that Mike Ranney wrote me? Do you remember how I ended it? I cherish the memories of a question my grandson asked me the other day when he said, Grandpa, were you a hero in the war? Grandpa said no. but I served in a company of heroes.
Joe Toy, oh, there was a big mech. And we used to have a few beers at night, and I'd sing. And Garnier would try to come over and sing. He'd say to Garnier, Garnier, you're Italian. You don't know this song. Garnier could sing it better than he did. The Bridget O'Flynn. How's it go? Oh. Bridget O'Flynn, Bridget O'Flynn, where have you been? Sure it's a fine time for you to come in. You went to see the big parade, the big parade, me I. Sure the big parade I never took so long in passing by. Look at your shoes, ain't it a sin, Bridget O'Flynn? Sure your story and your shoes are mighty thin. If you know anyone that owns a canoe, I'm telling you, Bridget, just what to do. Stay away from the water, Bridget, darling. Now that's the song Toy Like. Now that's what we sang. You only needed a sizzle of beer. Two beers, you were drunk because you were in great physical condition. You were too peaked, you know, and two beers, you were high as George of Pine, you know. 